I thought that might get the attention. Stubborn, stiff-necked, and hard-headed. Who hasn't heard those words before in their life? Uh, Lena says, oh, you're talking about Ed this morning. That's what I was, I was hearing. <laughs> you know, um, stubborn. What do you think when you think stubborn? I've always heard the expression, stubborn as a mule. And I've never worked mules, but those who have can uh, probably tell you that if you don't treat a mule right or get him in the right mode and know how to handle it, it, it you just can't hardly get one to budge. And so stubborn as a mule. A stiff neck, stiff neck. Now that goes back to animals as well. Um, the, uh, I don't, like I say, it's not my experience, but you're working an animal and you want them to turn. How do you do it? You turn their head. You get their head turned and the rest of them will follow. And so you think of an ox out there that you're trying to plow with or pull a cart with and uh, they don't want to turn. They just, they stiffen that neck and it's not going to move. And so you can't turn their neck. It's a Bible expression. He talks about the Israelites who were stiff necked. God just could not get them turned in the right way. Now, what do you think of when you think of hard headed? Hard headed. Well, have you ever wondered what your name means? Have you ever looked up and said, what does my name mean? Did, did you know that that's what William means? That's my name. I know I'm called Bill, but it, it means hard-headed. First, it's got the will in there. You know, the, the, a, a strong will, strong will. But that, that last part comes from that German Wilhelm Helm, Hel helmet. Okay, so it has something to do with being hard-headed. And uh, that's what my mother used to say I was. You're just so hard-headed. Well, I thought it was a compliment, you know, at the time. But, but it's not. It's not a compliment to be hard-headed. All right, here's why I picked those words. You don't find those words in Isaiah chapter 48, but you find the thought, the idea behind these words. Isaiah 48 and verse 4 obstinate. That's what stubborn is. Obstinate. And then, thy neck is an iron sinew. Well, you're just trying to bend a piece of iron. Just stiff-necked is what that's talking about. And thy brow, brass. That's hard-headed. So those aren't the usual words used for that. But the prophet is waxing poetic here. Israel, he's saying, that's your trouble. You have been obstinate. You have, have a neck with an iron sinew. And you have a brow of a brass. God just could not turn Israel. And Isaiah is letting them know, that's why you're in this mess. If you could have just conformed to me, if you'd only listened to what I had tried to teach you. Here it is. It's Isaiah 48, 18 through 19. It's a lament by God concerning his people Israel. He says, Oh, that thou hast hearkened Unto my commandments. That's why the top of the bulletin has it that all that thou hast hearkened. If you had only listened. If you just would just open your ears and hear. And as we get in this chapter, you're going to see there's a lot about you should have listened in this chapter. All that thou hast hearkened unto my commandments. What's happening here? Israel has been carried away from their homeland and away off into Babylonian captivity. And God is letting them know through Isaiah. Now remember, Isaiah is about 100 to 150 years earlier. But they weren't paying attention to Isaiah when Isaiah was preaching. And Isaiah wrote it all up into a scroll. And now they're in captivity. Now read the scroll. 
You wouldn't listen. Read this scroll. This is why these things have happened to you. And they could open up that scroll and read these words of Isaiah and say, sure enough, that's just what the Lord said was going to happen to us. And it has happened. And it didn't be, need to be that way. Look at the bulletin. We'll talk about that poem Whittier wrote of all the saddest things it's said. You know, the, the saddest of all. It might have been, or if only, if only those sad, sad words. But Israel, it didn't have to be this way. If you had just listened to me, and then he lists, I think it's five, one, two, three, four, five, five things. Five things you would have enjoyed. One, You'd have had peace like a river. Uh, we sing that song, Peace Like a River. Isaiah is going to talk about that later too. It's not the only place that thought occurs. But um, I tell you, it's peaceful to sit down, river flowing by. Uh, I like to go down on the Bolden's farm there at Hickory Creek, you know, and sit up. Sometimes we just sit in the creek. I mean, we'll take a chair and we'll just sit out in the creek and let the water flow by. And it's like you can just see all your cares float away down the stream. It's just peace like a river. It could have been this way with you, Israel, if you just listen to me. And thy righteousness is waves of the sea. I mean, just the waves just keep coming, don't they? One after another after another. It could have been like that with you, Israel. But if you hadn't been so stubborn... It says, and thy seed has also been as the sand. Isn't that what God had promised Abraham? Thy seed shall be as the sand of the sea and as the dust of the earth and as the stars in the heaven. And that has a spiritual fulfillment in the many that have the faith of Abraham. But in Isaiah's poetic preaching here, he says, you could have prospered. There would have been so many. And so, the, and thy offspring is the, of thy bowels like the gravel thereof. Well, I think some say the grains thereof. But again, it's that same idea. It's sort of a second repetition of that, of the abundance. But then number five, his name should not have been cut off nor destroyed from before me. That's what Israel felt like. Our names have been cut off. We don't, we don't amount to anything. Israel, what's that? We're just lost over here in Babylon. But it didn't have to be that way. If you had only listened to me, and I think that explains God's wrath. God's, how frustrating it is when you want to be good to someone Think of your children. You want to be good to them, but you have to punish them. That is so frustrating. And so God's wrath is here, and it didn't have to be that way. Well, let's think about ourselves now when we listen to this. I tell you what we don't want to be. We don't want to be stubborn. But when it comes to God, you don't want to be obstinate. So why stiffen your neck against what God said? Why be so hard-headed? And not when it comes to God. You want to humble yourselves and do what he says. And you don't want this being said about you when it comes to having to be turned and to be guided and directed by God. Let's look at how this chapter goes. See how it starts off? Hear this, O ye house of Jacob. There's going to be a lot in here about you should have heard. You need to listen Hear this, O house of Jacob, which are called by the name of Israel. That's what you're called. You see, Jacob means supplanter. Uh, Israel, that means the, the prince of God. Oh, you like that. It's the E-L, that's God's name. That's in the name Israel. You're called Israel. You're acting like a Jacob. But you're called by the name of Israel, and you're come forth out of the waters of Judah, and swear by the name of the Lord, and make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth, or in righteousness. That's what's called a hypocrite, isn't it? 
I mean, they're, they're claiming God. They talk about God. They like to swear by God. They, they like their name, Israel. But they don't live that way. Not in righteousness, not in truth. You're hypocrites, Jesus would call them in the New Testament. They call themselves by the holy city, that's Jerusalem, and stay themselves upon the God of Israel. The Lord of hosts is his name. That's what they say. I'll tell you what this reminds me of. Reminds me of the passage that Brian read just before we departed for Sunday school. And I have it here. It says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils. In thy name done many wonderful works. Then I'll profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. It's not saying it, is it? It's doing it. It wasn't in truth. It's not in righteousness. You say this, but you're not living it. You're hard-headed. And you won't be turned. And you're stubborn. Look at verse 3. You should have listened. I declared it. I declared the former things. Think of all the things from in the story of the Bible that God says, now this is going to come to pass. And it all comes to pass. Remember that Israel? I'm going to deliver you out of Egypt. I bring you into Canaan. I give you the promised land. You turn from me. You're going to be suffered from your enemies. All, all these things. It all came to pass. I declared unto you former things from the beginning. This is from the beginning of uh, Israel is what I'm taking this to be. From the start, I told you these things. You should have believed. You should have listened. It says, and they went forth out of my mouth, and I showed them, and suddenly, and, 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 and I did them suddenly, they came to pass. <laughs> Everything God says comes to pass, doesn't it? And then, because I knew, and here's that, that verse, I knew thou was obstinate. Thy neck is an iron sinew, and thy brow brass. I knew you'd be that way, but I told you, these are the things that were going to happen. And you look, they all happened, didn't they? It says, I have even from the beginning declared it to thee. Before it came to pass, I showed it thee. Lest thou shouldst have saved my idol, hath done them, and my graven image, and my olden image hath commanded them. It wasn't these idols. You got over there in Canaan. You started worshiping all these idols. They didn't, they didn't do this. I told you. Before any of this happened, this is what's going to happen. And it happened. And the reason I told you this before it happened, I wanted you to know it was me doing this. It wasn't your idols that you were worshiping that was doing this. Now, those are the former things. I declared the former things. Thou hast heard and seen all this and will not ye declare it. I have shown the new things. See the former things and the new things. I'm going to tell you some new things. And the new things was, remember, this is about 100 years before it happened. You're going into Babylonian captivity. Now, I've told you all these other things, they happened. Now I'm telling you a new thing, you'll go into captivity. And they still didn't hear but I'm going to tell you new things. Except from this time, even hidden things, and thou didst not know them. They're created now. See, I told you this was what would happen. And now here you are. They're created now. Those things I said I would do, I'm doing them right now. And that's why you're in this mess. You wouldn't listen it says and not from the beginning even before the day when thou heardest them not lest thou should say behold I knew them don't give me that oh I knew this was going to happen don't give me that you weren't listening 
I told you, you should have known and you should have listened and you should have hearkened. But you are too hard-headed to receive it. Verse 8, yea, thou heardest not. Yea, thou knowest that thou knewest not, yea, from the time that thine ear was not open. For I knew that thou wast deal very treacherously and wast called a transgressor from the womb. He's talking about the time when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. That was their womb. You've always been doing this. You, you remember they, they were complaining about Moses. Look, we're now we got to make bricks without straw. And just everything, complaining and grumbling, going into the wilderness, complaining about water, complaining. He gave them angels food. He fed them with manna. And they said, yeah, but we don't have onions. I mean, just complaining about it all and obstinate from the beginning. You've always been this way, Israel. So that was a transgressor from the womb. But now for my name's sake, I will defer mine anger. And for my praise, I will refrain for thee that I cut thee not off. Oh, they deserved it, didn't they? Why didn't God just cut them off? Well, he said, well, my ways aren't your ways and my thoughts aren't your thoughts. I have bigger things in store than you, Israel. My name is going to be praised all over this world. I'm going to use you to bring the Savior into the world and to establish my spiritual kingdom so I'm not going to cut you off. But don't think it's because you've been so good. Look how you have behaved. And yet, I'm going to defer my anger. Because i got bigger plans than you. In verse 10, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Why? Do we suffer like we do? Why does life have to be so hard? Why, why do these things happen? And why isn't everything just wonderful and easy? Sometimes we have to pass through a furnace of affliction. Isn't that a descriptive? The furnace, the heat, the, the turmoil. The agony of that, you have to pass through a furnace of affliction to be refined. That's what you do when you separate the silver from the dross. You melt it all out in the furnace of affliction until the silver is purified and the dross is taken away. And I've refined you. Here's why you're here. You're going through the furnace of affliction. But it's not working. It's, it's not like silver. You're so hard-headed, I can't even refine you. You're still bucking against me in the furnace of affliction. So, not like silver. And he says, for my own sake, even my own sake, I'll do it. For how should my name be polluted and I will not give my glory to another? No, I'm, but even so, you unrefined Israel. I'm not going to cut you off. I've still got plans and I'm still going to use you to accomplish those plans. Now listen, hearken unto me, old Jacob. Like they're not worthy to be called Israel. Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel. My called, I'm he. Here again. He says it several times in Isaiah, doesn't he? I'm the first and the last. God knows everything from the beginning. He can see all the way to the end. I'm the first and the last. And then talking about how great my hand hath also laid the foundations of the earth. My right hand has spanned the heavens. 
When I call to them, they stand up together. That's God's creation. Can you think about, okay, heavens and earth stand up. I'm just like personifying them that they're going to do what I say. They stand up together. They stand at attention. When I call to them, they stand together. All ye assemble yourselves and hear. Which among them hath declared these things? The Lord hath loved him. Now who are we talking about? Well, that's not apparently clear, but we're going to look at what it says here about him and what we had just read in just a chapter or two previous. And I'm convinced the him here is King Cyrus, the Persian. God's going to raise the Persian king up. He's going to overthrow Babylon. He's going to let Israel go home. Look what he says about him. I have loved him. He will do his pleasure on Babylon. That's what Cyrus will do. And his arm shall be on the Chaldeans. That's what, that's what King Cyrus is going to do. I, even I, have spoken. Yea, I have called him. I have brought him. And he shall make his way prosperous. I believe this is talking about Cyrus here. Now some would say, well, he's talking about Israel. Or maybe he's even talking about the, the Lord coming. And, and there's some reasons for that. But in the context of where Israel is now and what Isaiah has been saying about the coming of Cyrus, I'm convinced he's talking about King Cyrus when he's talking about this. And so in verse 16, come near unto me and hear this. Come, come here, gather around. Just get up close. I want you to hear this. I've not spoken in secret from the beginning from the time that it was, there, I, there am I. And now the Lord God in his spirit hath sent me. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I'm the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. Oh, that thou hast hearkened to my commandments. See, here it is. And this is where we were earlier. Then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. Thy seed also had been as the sand, and the offspring of thy bowels like the gravel thereof. His name should have not been cut off nor destroyed from before me. But you're going to go home. I'm going to let you go home. It'll be a second exodus. I brought you out of Egypt and led you through the wilderness to the promised land. I'm going to let you leave Babylon and go back home. Go ye forth of Babylon. Flee from the Chaldeans. With a voice of singing declare ye. You remember how they sang on the far side of the Red Sea. The, the, the Miriam banging the timbrels together and the women singing and rejoicing over their deliverance. He said, with a voice of singing, declare ye, tell this, utter it even to the ends of the earth. Say ye, the Lord hath redeemed his servant Jacob, and they thirsteth not when he led them through the deserts. He caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them. He claved the rock also, and the waters gushed out. You remember that story? When Moses, first time the Lord said, strike the rock, and he struck the rock, like the Lord said, and the waters came forth, and they had water in the desert. So he's comparing their deliverance from Babylon to their deliverance from Egypt. And he's letting them know, even so, I'm going to let you go home. But the last verse, the last verse, there's no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. If those that would continue to stiffen their necks and harden their hearts against him, they wouldn't have the peace. 
that there's great blessings in store for the poor in spirit who will follow and take my lead and listen to me and let me guide them. But the wicked, no peace for the wicked. No peace for the wicked. Here's what this reminds me of. A passage that strikes a fear in my heart and troubles me. I don't want to think about this. It's in the book of Revelation. Where he says in Revelation 14, 9 through 11. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or on his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest. No rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receiveth the mark of his name. No peace. No rest. Uh, there have been times I've been so glad when the day was over and I could rest and get some sleep and recover from the toils and the cares and the pains of this life. What a great medicine is rest. But there's no rest in eternity. Tormented day and night forever and ever with no rest and no peace for the wicked. The book of Isaiah. What a preacher. Um, this first part is about you need to trust me. Don't trust the idols. You listen to me. I've been here for you. I haven't forgotten you. He's writing to those in captivity. That's that first part. We're going to enter the second part, Isaiah 48 through 57, where we're going to talk about the suffering servant that's going to come. And then that last part, Isaiah 58 through 66, is about the church and the kingdom that will be established that will come to pass as well. So that's kind of the three parts of this latter part of Isaiah. We've come to the end of the first part, and I want to remind you how it began. In Isaiah 40 and verse 1, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith the Lord. He's going to want to speak, speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. And they haven't been forgotten in their captivity. But look how it ends. There's no peace, saith the Lord, for the wicked. The comfort that the Lord provides for us, is there for us if we'll receive it. But if we're going to be obstinate, if we're going to have a neck with a sinew of iron, and if we're going to have a brow of brass, you're not going to get that comfort. There's no peace for the wicked. There's some that will not obey the gospel because they're just stubborn. It's not their way, and they're going to resist God's way. But there's no peace, and there's no rest in that way. And so let's learn those principles and know how to apply them. Let's not be like that people in Israel. Let's submit and humble ourselves and be refined in that furnace and come forth as silver and come forth as gold and receive his comfort. That invitation is open as we stand and sing the invitations.